Hey everyone, I'm Julie Gunlock, your host for the 11th episode of the Bespoke Parenting Hour and the first episode for 2021. Happy New Year and goodbye and good riddance to 2020, I guess I should say. Uh, Things are starting to look up a bit. Two COVID-19 vaccines have been developed and approved for use and several more are in the approval process, which will only quicken uh, the, the vaccination process. Um, The rollout, of course, hasn't been as quick as hoped. Uh, People are getting vaccinated, mainly essential workers. These are the people that sort of keep the trains running and also frontline health workers. These are the people who are actually treating those who contracted COVID-19. So that is good news. It's good news that some are getting vaccinated. And again, I think we'll see... um, a speeding up of of sort of you know nationwide vaccinations once more um, are approved. Um, so that's a great way to sta- start off the year. And I'm really excited to still be hosting the Bespoke Parenting Hour. For any new listeners we have out there, and we really do hope to grow the listenership of the Bespoke Parenting Hour this year. This podcast is focused on how parents should custom tailor their parenting style to fit what's best for their families, themselves, and most importantly, their kids. So we're going to start off this year's Bespoke Parenting Hour talking about a really important issue, kids and allergies. I'm joined today by a very good friend, Lisa Gable. I'm thrilled that she is the first guest um, of this new year. Lisa and I have worked together over the years uh, in a lot of different capacities and on some really interesting projects, mainly related to food and nutrition. Lisa is a legend and a true leader in Washington, D.C. She's been a leader in all sectors, the public sector, the private sector, and the nonprofit sector. She has served four U.S. presidents and two governors, and has also served as an ambassador to the United Nations. For many years, Lisa was in the corporate world as a senior vice president of global public policy at PepsiCo, and she spent 15 years in Silicon Valley. We're so glad she managed to escape. Um, She's been on the boards of the Boys and Girls Club and the Girl Scouts and for many years was the president of the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation, which was this fabulous coalition of both food corporations and government health agencies that worked really hard to improve and did improve the American diet. This is where Lisa and I really got to work closely together and it was just a great partnership and I learned a lot about this issue from Lisa. Today, Lisa is the CEO of the Food Allergy Research and Education Organization. It's called FAIR. FAIR is known as the world's leading non-governmental organization doing food allergy advocacy, and it is the largest private funder of food allergy research. So this is a very important organization. While doing all of this, Lisa, (laughs) while doing all of what I just listed, Lisa was and is busy being a mom to her beautiful and very accomplished daughter who I had think the world of. Um, And she has also mentored countless young women in Washington. I am way too old to be considered sort of, um, you know, a young woman that she mentored. But I do consider Lisa one of my personal mentors. So I'm so thrilled that she's here today. Welcome, Lisa. Well, thanks, Julie. You are you are way too kind. (laughs) I really appreciate being one of your first guests for 2021. Yes, well, it is a much well, Lex, you know, look, I, I, I feel like we could start off talking about 2020, and t- and I I re- I sort of would love to get the updates on what's going on, but but I think um, we can all agree, you know, with two vaccines in the marketplace right now and more coming down the pike, 2021 at least at this point looks like it's going to be a lot better. So hooray for that! Yeah, we're excited too. In fact, I just heard that my chief operating officer gets his shot on January 26th. My mother got hers on Wednesday, so things seem oh. to be moving. That's great. That's great. Well, to pivot to another really important health issue, um, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here is I know that this is an important issue. I have friends who deal with this. I know children who deal with this. But as the mom of three kids who don't have any food allergy problems, I don't pay as much attention to this. And I think that that's a that's like at the cost of some of the kids and families who do d- deal with this. And I think that there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of myths out there. And there's also sort of strangely and sadly some impatience on this issue. So I'm hoping we can tackle, um, you know, a, a few of those issues today. So 
I think the first thing I'd like to talk about is a little bit about FAIR itself, how you got involved with this organization, and what it does. Sure. So I joined FAIR in June of 2018. And as you know, my business experience is turning around organizations, taking over an organization that has a very important mission, but that mission needs to be elevated. And one of the primary ways it needs to be elevated is by having industry having a seat at the table. And so I was brought in 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 June of 2018, and I was told three things. One is that we have to raise $200 million dollars. Uh, Secondly, that we need to bring industry to the table, and we really need to make research our our primary focus area. And so we we dug into that. We restructured the organization by 83%. Uh, We're very much focused on on bringing research into the mix at the level it needs to be at in order to drive solutions for patients, and we raised $85 million. So all exciting, but why are we doing this? And the reason we're doing it is that uh, 85 million Americans avoid purchasing products that contain the top nine proteins that can trigger an allergic reaction. That's one in every four Americans. At the top of that peak is people with life-threatening food allergies. 32 million Americans, if they accidentally ingest a food, they can go into anaphylaxis and they can die in up to three minutes. So obviously, if you are a mom who has a child with a life-threatening food allergy, you live in a constant state of anxiety. And that's one reason I think that it's so hard for people to understand how the level of anxiety our moms have, because as that child begins to leave the nest, as they go to elementary school, you're heavily dependent upon other people understanding what they need to do in order to keep your child safe. How many children, you say 32 million Americans total, but how many children suffer from food allergies? So we're talking about uh, basically 5.6 million children. That's one in 13. And the best way to think about it is that's two students in every classroom. Good grief. Well, you know, that is significant. And again, I think, you know, when people hear those numbers, it, they kind of go, oh, but I don't I don't think people know this. And I'm glad that your organization is, is sort of building up and getting the information out more. Um, what what are the, you mentioned the top allergies. Can you describe those? What are the top allergies? What are things people are allergic to? Sure. So we track 170 food allergies, but the top nine are those allergens. Well, the top eight are those allergens, which requ- which the FDA requires food manufacturers to label for as part of the food safety protocols. We've been advocating for the ninth one, which is sesame. So let me tell you what they oh. are. Peanut, milk, shellfish, tree nut, egg, fin fish, that's fish with little fins, uh, wheat, soy, and sesame. So sesame has 1.5 million people who suffer from anaphylaxis, which is that's a lot of people is one reason we want it to be added to the top nine. And we've been in, in very positive conversations with industry, the FDA, um, and on Capitol Hill about that need. But those are the ones that are the most frequent. The one that's most frequent is peanut. That's why you always hear about peanuts, yeah. 25%, 8, 8, 8 million people of the 32 million people we just talked about. But a lot, most people with one allergy actually have multiple, have another allergy. So it's, you know, it is very common for someone to have a peanut allergy and then they're allergic to other things too. You just, you know, you list off these things. Like I was trying to type as you were listing them off and, you know, peanut milk, wheat, those were some of the things I got down, obviously sesame, but all of those things, you know, it's, you've worked with food corporations. I've worked on the issue of food manufacturing and goodness, those, I mean, milk, you know, milk powders and, nut powders and oh my gosh, wheat, you know, these are in so many things, which really makes you thankful for food labeling. But you know, there are things that don't get labeled. And what do you what how do parents deal with that the fear of, you know, again, you know, it's very, very small amounts that might not be labeled. Or for instance, if you go to a bakery and, you know, they have sand, you know, homemade things and you're relying on the label that's sort of ha- handwritten. I mean, how do parents deal with th- that kind of issue? Again, these these ingredients seem to be in everything these days. They, they, are, they are very anxious parents. They're very anxious parents. And that's why I know that uh, people sit there and, and wonder. It's like, well, why do you have this anxiety? And it's because, as you say, the, the one thing to know about food allergens is their protein. And right. so you're talking about basic proteins. You're also talking about foods 
that are that are basics, right? If you are somebody who has a has a uh, financial constraints, you know, maybe you're in an underserved community, or your husband or wife just lost their job. We're talking about having to forego really basic cost-effective proteins like right. peanut, uh, you know, peanut right. butter and right. and thin fish. That's that's tuna fish and egg and and dairy. So. Uh, they do live in a great deal of fear. Um, on the horizon, one one of the issues that we're in conversation with right now, and we've been very pleased. In fact, I I, I was able to brief 40 CEOs this week, and we we've, we've briefed hundreds of uh, consumer goods companies. Is cleaning up what we call precautionary allergen labeling. That's making sure that all labels that have you know that tell you that these things are in your food are the same. Now I mention that because. More people are shopping online, and also mm-hmm. we have these things called QR codes. And QR codes, you may have seen it's that weird dotty-looking thing on a package that you yeah. scan with your telephone. Yeah. And when you do, Smart Label tells you what's in the food. Right. And so as we see more and more people going into digital, we are, are asking companies to think about, you know, listing Smart. beyond the top nine. The Europeans, the Europeans you know, they, they monitor 12 so labels and, and uh, standardizing them, but also having information in a digital format makes it much easier for people to go on, see what's in the food, and make sure they're ordering something that their child can eat. You know, this is another example of why modernization technology makes life better. And I'll get a little bit into that later on, because I do want to talk to you about, you know, sort of innovation in the food industry. But I want to, before we get, go on that subject, I want to pivot a little bit back to, you know, parents. And you mentioned when we were in the beginning, you said something that I thought was sort of very thought provoking, um, which is you rely on, on, you not only rely on a little child to take care of themselves, like if they're away from home, but you're relying on other parents. And what bothers me about this issue is that I see a lot of lack of sympathy from other parents. I see eye rolls. I see this sort of idea that everything's made up. And I think there are some reasons for that. But I have an example. Years ago, I was in a classroom. This was a preschool classroom where the children ate in the classroom at little tables. And the teacher said to the group, it was, it was the, you know, it was sort of the welcome to school meeting and all the parents were gathered around and the teacher said, you know, we do have a child in this class with a peanut allergy. So if you wouldn't mind avoiding peanut butter as snacks, right? And you think about the other available options in the grocery store, there's thousands of other options to send your kid with a snack. I had no, I, you know, I just sort of nodded along and another parent actually started to argue and saying, oh, my little son, you know, he, he doesn't need anything but peanut butter jelly sandwiches for, for a snack. And he has since birth or whatever, you know, and I could, I, my, my jaw dropped and, um, I really couldn't believe it. And I was actually friends with the mom who had the child who was allergic to peanuts and, and she was shocked as well. And so I think, you know, I, I'm kind of curious if you guys have kind of looked into that. What is the reason for that? Is it just that everybody has an allergy or a sensitivity these days and, oh, I can't, you know, I can't deal with it? Or what's the reason for this sort of, I don't know, hostility? Well, you know, we call it, we do call it the eye roll. And I think that uh, That's many funny. parents, <laughs> yeah, many parents have adopted different diets for their families. You know, yeah. Some, some families have, have really leaned into vegan and some families, you know, may, may lean into other diets. And uh, we, we do know that uh, celiac disease, which is a very, very serious disease that can send someone into the hospital, um, yeah. it, it, that the gluten-free has become um, sort of a badge of honor and it's almost yes. seen as a health halo. And so I, I do think the gluten-free phenomena although it has been beneficial to families with celiac and and also with wheat allergies, has created a dynamic where it's misunderstood and people kind of claim an avoidance diet as a a health health badge. It's a a halo. And and and, and that's detrimental to the mom of a child with celiac and it's detrimental to the mom of a child with life-threatening food allergies. And so we are really trying to make sure that people understand that the diseases are very real. They're very frightening. Um, they do send people to the emergency room. You know, food allergies. They kill. Cost, they kill. They, they kill $25 billion yeah. in medical costs. It's a yeah. big issue. It is. You know, it's interesting. I'm so glad you brought that up because I remember actually writing about this, the difference between a food allergy and and this 
food sensitivity, which became very popular. There are like people making lots of money on food sensitivity tests, right? And these terms get thrown around where, you know, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get into specifics, but certain foods do not really sit well with me. Okay. I know them. I am, I am, I'm not 14 years old. I'm able, I like know now what, what foods work well with me and what don't. And that doesn't mean I'm allergic to that food. It means, you know, maybe my body doesn't exactly like it. Okay. And so there's this, there are these sort of the, I, I guess the invention of new terms that people tend to think are full-blown allergies or, you know, are really dangerous that I think, yes, you're right. It has, and that gluten phenomenon is one of the things that I think made people kind of roll their eyes. The eye roll. I love that you guys call it the eye roll. Um, you know, but I think with this podcast, this podcast is about like how, you know, you should parent the best way, but it doesn't mean ignoring how other people, other people's needs in parenting. And that's one thing that I think is really important. And I've always said all along in this podcast, that doesn't mean, for instance, ignore what doctors say, for instance, about vaccines, or if you go to the hospital and your kid looks like they have a broken leg, you know, the doctors are probably someone you should listen to, not, you know, <laughs> you're probably, you should probably listen. And so I think on allergies, that's why it's so important that this information get out there because I think people are confused about the different terms out there and, you know, sort of the different, you know, conditions um, that are, are people perceive as being an allergy but aren't. Um, but you're right, it is a detriment to the kids who actually have, or, you know, even the adults, anyone who has an actual allergy. Um, I want to pivot a little bit over to um, to sort of what the food industry is doing to focus on these issues outside of labeling. And this has more to do with science, um, you know, about sort of innovation in food manufacturing. This kind of gets into GMOs and some of the other things that they're doing, the really creative and interesting things that they're doing in the food industry. D does the food industry have an appetite for innovation in terms of, you know, genetically modifying a, a food product so that the allergen isn't in the protein is taken out. What, what's the status of that? So there is, um, there's a lot of work being done and scientists across the world, a really amazing team of scientists uh, that split their time between Silicon Valley and Israel who are looking at gene editing and gene editing is different than genetic modification, yes. right? It's, yes. it's not fundamentally changing the protein itself it, or the, the plant itself. It's really removing things right. uh, within its natural state. They, what I, you know, I have high hopes for it. I, I am hoping it comes to solve the problem. I have had my enthusiasm damp and meetings of late because I'll go on about how this is amazing and it's great <laughs> but being reminded that these uh, you know and then I get the scientist that tells me well Lisa we need to give you the facts uh, the peanut industry uh, is funding a lot of it that is where their focus is on peanut and wheat but they are very complex proteins and do not I am not the scientist in the room so I am not even going to try and explain what that means no, of but course. what it does mean is that they're not sure that they can they, that they're there yet and um and they're also not sure how the removal of the protein will affect the the, the product itself and so again yeah. peanuts the easiest thing for us all to talk about is is if you you know if they're able to remove the protein or the proteins that are causing the problem then will you get the same consistency will it taste the same will it will it enable you to make peanut butter will it you know give you that texture that you need which is so pertinent to that particular product so they, they are definitely investing in it, and it is something that I believe should somebody uh, be able to to uh, scientifically get it to a place where the texture, the taste, the cost of production, and don't ever yeah. forget the cost of production because right, it is right. fundamental, as well as the the safety element is is repeatable. Then we'll be you know we'll be in a fantastic place. But I I will tell you the one place where the food industry has really really done a fantastic job and they do not get the credit for it is on cleaning and production. And we all got a taste of cleaning when we got to see the New York City uh, Metro being cleaned in like 15 seconds uh, during the beginning of COVID. But the food companies, I've told them, I think the biggest place where, where we need to be able to help them in telling their story is that the Fortune 500 companies, the big companies, 
spend billions of dollars a year on cleaning equipment. And, the, and they also put a great deal of thought into how they line up things on the manufacturing line. Um, and I've had companies, some of the largest companies in the world, will literally throw away multi-million dollar equipment if it doesn't demonstrate that right. it, it is cleaning well enough. And yeah. then they also will have non, they'll have, uh, they will never put something with an allergen on the, on the, um, on the manufacturing line. If it is shared, they will do the allergen or a place where there could be risk of allergen for the second production. So if you think about first production, first thing in the morning, those are the, you know, and then if they do second production, they do a lot of cleaning between those, but then they go into the next one. So they, so they're producing possibly later in the evening um, and they can have a longer period of time to clean and they're testing equipment for whether or not they can test whether or not an allergen is in there. Uh, You know, McCormick has invested heavily in testing. They make spices because it's a big issue for them. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting to hear you talk about this. And I, and can I, I just want to tell our listeners and you, Lisa, that my dog, and I don't know if my microphone is picking up on this, but my dog has decided to chew on a bone right underneath my, <laughs> my desk. And so I think it's like sort of like theme music. We're talking about food. And so if you do hear crunching, I am not eating chips or like munching on a Jolly ranch- Rancher. It is my dog who is... Um, kind of impolite, I have to say, to choose this particular area to chew on his bone. So anyway, to well, listeners and Lisa. point out that you have a dog, thanks I, to my dog Daisy, thanks. because your boys came to my house and they fell in love with Daisy and then oh they, my. they wanted a Daisy dog. I am telling you, Daisy might still win my heart. That, your dog is the sweetest, sweetest dog. I've often threatened that I was going to stop by your house and steal Daisy. So I love your dog. And yes, indeed, right after we left Lisa's house, we, my husband and I had managed to go years and years without a dog. We were kind of thrilled because you know three three boys, you know, we kind of have our hands full and we'd gone so long and the kids hadn't asked. And then we went to Lisa's house for that beautiful lunch and the kids were nonstop begging for a dog. So thanks, Lisa, kind of. No, we love, we love our dog. She's wonderful. And she is with us today on this podcast. So apologies for the crunching. Um, I almost lost my train of thought, but going back, you what you were just talking about is fascinating about, you know, you're talking about the these manufacturers being able to test products, being able to clean equipment, being able to ensure that their products are free of the, you know, any kind of you know, and if it has it, a product in it, it will label it. But, you know, these are, this, this is all modernization, right? This is all innovation and modernization. This is, we're talking about, you know, by and large factories produce this really clean, really safe, tested, labeled food. And it's funny when you think about trends and sort of, you know, sort of you know, trendy food, it's become popular now. It's almost like the word factory is a pejorative and like mass production is a pejorative. But these are the good things about that. These are, you know, sort of, you know, cleanliness and consistency uh, in in producing the food. And again, all of this safety testing. So these are the things that are really good. And I, I do I have to say, Lisa, it's so funny because you think of these major food manufacturers who do such great things. But you know, there, there's a big push out there for organic and clean and all these sort of labels that sort of take the consumer away from any kind of mass production where, you know, in some ways, this, this kind of manufacturing is what's really needed to ensure that certain allergens and things like that don't get into food. So it is kind of interesting. And I wonder if there was some great discovery where so this is a question more on the consumer side rather than um, the manufacturing side. You know, I wonder if there'd be a uh, if there'd be a market for it. Like if there was suddenly allergy-free peanut butter, you know the allergy community and certainly the child allergy community much better. You know, probably better than anyone. You know, would there be an appetite for that? Would there would they rush to buy it, or is this sort of um, requirement that every BB sort of non-GMO and non-gene edited um, would it does that sort of win the day what and I mean even if even if allergy parents did rush to buy these products that's not enough necessarily to keep that business booming what do you think the appetite for that would be 
Well, it's one reason that we wanted to make sure the manufacturers understand it, understood the complete market. We did research with McKinsey that shows 85 million Americans, one in four Americans, do not buy products with the top nine proteins that can trigger an allergic reaction. As I said, 32 million of those are life-threatening food allergy, but the next segment of those are people with medically tested food intolerances. They have something in their system that they, so they cannot let, eat the food. So let me, let me interrupt there. I'm Sorry, I just want to be sure. So you're saying that people, more people than who have allergies, are by, by are trying to avoid allergies, and, like, right? And uh, people, you, yeah, people with life threatening food allergies. But the issues around food intolerances are real. There, you are having more and more adults who are, who are having medically, you know, issues with food intolerances. Yeah. And and what happens is that the um, people in their households also avoid those foods. Right. Right. So. For a manufacturer, what the potential is, is that they can come up with solution sets that provide an alternative of some sort to those individuals. That's a big market for them. There's actually a business market in this. And so the question is, is it a big enough market? It, it is a big enough market. It's 85 million people. And, um, and so we, we flipped the conversation. We spent way too much time trying to figure out if there was a big enough market for allergen-free products that you know people would put allergen-free products into market. So I think as companies look at innovation that allows them to address the broader issue that that's actually what's going to give us the solution sets. I think with gene editing, I'm hoping that you know again GMOs got uh, got a bad rap, and and you and I right. had discussion about our our personal opinions about that. But I I do think that with gene editing, it's going to be a different conversation. And part that there there are a couple of elements within that. The the second is that we are now, you know, people are looking for alternatives to. Um, to farming and in the mainstay agricultural space, you see more vertical farming, more urban farming. Right. You see people that are are creating alternatives to fish farms, and and so I, I think that the broader public is now becoming um, more aware of where science is taking us, and when that awareness and that solution set fits with their opinions about global warming, you, you may. You may actually see that the next generation of people addressing these issues that are addressing them within the broader spectrum of how far we can advance things um, from a technical standpoint and an innovation standpoint, I, I, I actually do have high hopes that we're actually going to see more agreement around the different solutions that get created and that we won't get ourselves so dug into conversations that you know, resulted in quote unquote food fights um, during the last 15 years. Yeah, and I think, honestly, I think... I think food manufacturers have sort of learned some lessons from the initial, you know, the, what was it called? The flavor saver tomato. That was the first GMO that was ever approved to be put on the market. Um, and, you know, subsequent um, products. Uh, I think they've learned some, um, some lessons from that. And, and again, I think when we're talking about editing a pro a product, gene editing, as you say, a little bit different. Although I think to some, re some of the really hardcore activists, it doesn't matter. But um, well, one and one thing to think about is when we change from natural flavors, when we change from from chemicals to natural flavors, natural flavors are proteins. Are they are the foods that cause an allergic reaction. When we change people into a plant based diet you are substituting meat with a pea protein that can possibly trigger an allergic reaction for right. somebody with peanut allergy. So you have all these unintended consequences. And I think that's the conversation we need to be very upfront about is yeah. I've talked to folks about using AI at the beginning of the, the, the renovation or innovation process. When, when a food company is creating you know, a new food, they're now using AI to try and figure out, well, if we change sugars and fats, you know, what would it do to the consistency of the food? What are right. things we need to do in order to change? What if they entered allergens into that? And you're using AI so that if you're creating a plant-based food, you're actually thinking about allergens when you're actually making those substitutions. Now, you know, it, you mentioned AI. And again, I, I don't mean to get off the subject too much, but it really is fascinating what they're doing now you know, lab grown meat. That's not the, that's not the way that the food manufacturer li would like it to be called, but it is. And it, it is fascinating what they're able, what they're able to do now. And I have eaten 
you know, the, I can't remember what they're called, Lisa, you probably, re- you probably know better than I do the, 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 you know, the plant-based meat that tastes and, and bleeds just like beef. Um, I can't remember what it's called. Beyond Before, meat. There's Beyond Brands. Yeah, Beyond, beyond Brands. Yes, and it's really it ta- it's it's delicious. It it's it fool it could fool someone, in my opinion. It really is so meat like, and I I love all these stories. I love these stories. I don't like misinformation about the real thing that oftentimes drives people to these products. But I do think it's great that there's innovation, and I think that that is what um, what we're going to see in the allergy space. And I think it's so great that you and Fair are out there um, doing more to publicize this issue. Um, I, I think the last thing I want to tell, I want to sort of go back to the kids before we conclude here, but I'd like to, you know, schools are on people's minds right now for obvious reasons. Um, how have things improved in schools for kids who suffer from allergies? They've definitely improved and fair uh, and uh, provides training for schools. We have a thing called fair check, which is actually uh, for, you know, colleges and universities, uh, restaurants, food services at schools that they can go through and be trained on food allergens. Uh, Secondarily, as I I do think we're raising awareness and that's one of our jobs is to raise awareness about the life threatening nature of food allergies. Uh, It depends on the school. Some families are very tolerant. And then what you also find is for some reason, we're not sure why you'll you'll find a school that has a lot more kids with allergies and mm. then we'll go to another school that has has fewer kids with allergies so it also depends on the community's awareness about the issue right. you know one thing i would encourage is if you have a child who is in uh, middle school uh, late elementary school let's say you know fifth and sixth grade and above get your kids change you know not only is it that families should go in and talk about you know don't have peanuts in the classroom and here's the importance of knowing about food allergies, but also get your kids trained on how to use an epinephrine auto injector. Because yeah. if you have a, a friend, you know, I had a, a former staff member who would go into schools and train people on an orange and teach everybody how to, how to administer the um, epinephrine auto injector. I keep calling it that versus EpiPen because there are actually now <laughs> five different choices in market. And, uh, and we like choice, right? It gives us right, more right. options. Um, so, uh, is, uh, you know, learn how to learn how to administer it yourself. And I think by the nature of getting families to also do that is that you really realize how hard it is. I personally yeah. used to have to use one. Um, and I, I had a horrible time giving myself a shot. I could not imagine, you know, in the moment having to administer one right. to another child or for a teacher too. So I think that brings home the severity of it also. Well, you know, I, I, I do think some schools could really improve. I know that my school sort of has the a- allergy kid table. And I used to go in about once a week to have lunch with my son. Um, I have three. So I, I wasn't like the weird mom who went once a week to the same son. I would face it out. And it probably was once a week. It was probably, now I sound like a total weirdo. It was probably once a month. But anyway, I, uh, I would go in and have lunch with them. And inevitably the allergy table would have one kid at it. And that just drove me nuts because I felt like, come on, you know, there's got to be better ways. Um, and, and, you know, sh- her parents even said, I, you know, it's, in some cases it could be, I don't know, some it, really, really severe allergy or maybe a choice on the parents' part. But in this case, it wasn't. It was a little girl who did not have to sit by herself. And so I think that more education for educators um, and not just public schools, private schools, all sorts of schools um, and, you know, community centers and that kind of stuff is really important. So I'm glad that you guys are reaching out um, to schools. Um, I think the last question I have is just more about where people can learn about FAIR. I know you have a YouTube channel and several resources. So just give our listeners um, a little bit of information on where to find more more about FAIR and the work that you do. Well, thanks for asking. You want to go to foodallergy.org. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok even. And TikTok. Are you dancing on TikTok, yes. Lisa? I, I'm not, but other people are. <laughs> so, uh, but more importantly is go to YouTube 
look up the Living Teal channel. That is a new channel that we uh, introduced a number of months ago. It has amazing high-end content. I brought in a group of Hollywood producers that worked at Sony wow. and MTV. And we have uh, different cooks from the, uh, from the Food Network. We have stars like Rashad Jennings and uh, Shannon Miller, both, both well-known athletes. And we have an Emmy-winning award uh, winner uh, who is uh, Heather Booker that people just love. In fact, Julie, Heather Booker reminds all of us of you. Oh, no. Uh, and she does. And then she's, she, you guys would be a match made in heaven. You're so similar in personality and the way you approach things. But Heather does uh, Living Teal Holidays. So the Teal Holiday series from Christmas to Valentine's to Easter uh, to Hanukkah, she is out there so Go to our YouTube channel, uh, which is the Living Teal channel, and you will see lots of fun content that really teaches people how to live their best lives and makes food allergies a little friendlier conversation. Can you spell that? It's living and then T-E-A-L or T, is it? T-E-A-L, which is the color of food allergies. So Living uh, Teal, well, T-E-A-L channel. Who knew? I didn't. So that is very interesting. Thank you. Okay. That is really good. I'm going to. I am going to go check that out. And listen, I think this issue is really important. And Lisa, I mean, we talk on personal matters anyway, but please keep us updated. If FAIR is doing anything um, that you want promoted or, I mean, I know you have your own promotional channels, but IWF would love uh, to share that and we'd love to keep up with you. And I'd like to have you on again as these issues come up. Um, there's always exciting developments in the food industry and especially having to do with allergies. So I hope you'll come back on and I always love talking to you. I feel like I now want to like hang up and then call you and we can talk about personal stuff like Daisy. But um, But this has been great and I'm really glad you came on. Well, thanks for having me. Tell your boys I said hello. They I always will. amuse me on Facebook <laughs> and, uh, and, and in other ways. So uh, have a wonderful new year and thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for being here for another episode of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. If you enjoyed this episode or like the podcast in general, please leave a rating or review on iTunes. This helps ensure that the podcast reaches as many listeners as possible. If you haven't subscribed to the Bespoke Parenting Hour on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts, please do so so you won't miss an episode. Don't forget to share this episode and let your friends know that they can get Bespoke episodes on their favorite podcast app. From all of us here at the Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening.